This is George, I'm just kidding, this is Parker. And Precious is uh, beneath our camera person's feet right now. She's catching a little bit of snooze. We just got done feeding them. This is their roadmap to success. Um, now basically George is a little bit of an insecure dog. Um, and so he has a tendency to roll over a lot. If you go to pet him, he immediately rolls over and goes belly up. That's too submissive a posture. So I'd like to have no one petting him when he does that. As soon as we walk over to him, as soon as he lifts his leg or starts doing it, just walk away or stop petting and engaging with him. Now, eventually, if he gets to the point where you're petting him, he kind of lays back and then gradually opens and gives you his chest, that's different. Right now, he's doing it as you're walking towards him. It's too submissive. Um, we want him to build up his confidence, and so one of the ways we can do that is petting with a purpose. So I think that he's been overloved. Um, his guardians love him very much. Um, they came from a rescue situation, both dogs did. And like a lot of our guardians do, they love the dog so much they want them to know that they're in a safe place. And so we shower them with love and affection, which is a very healthy and important part of the rehabilitation process. However, that needs to be a short-term period. If you're watching this at home, usually two to four weeks is what we're looking for for the unconditional love. Dogs interpret unconditional love as weakness. So if we continue loving our dog unconditionally, that can give them the impression that they think that they need to be in charge of us. And I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. But we are starting off with an insecure dog to begin with, with low self-esteem. Then he feels like he's responsible for the humans and the humans don't listen to him. That stresses him out even more. So we want to basically remove the burden of responsibility from him so that he can just be a good, happy, well-adjusted dog. So um, we want to build up his confidence and self-esteem. We can do that a couple ways. Um, first of all, we're going to enforce rules consistently and kind of shrink his world. So no, not being allowed on the furniture because the higher a dog sits, the more rank they have. Certainly not up here. Um, and then we're going to do this no furniture until he starts behaving better and we, the behavior problems we have are gone. Then at that point, invitation to get on the furniture only and then only for good behavior. So if he's up here and he starts barking, he has to immediately get down. Now, if he starts barking, what I do is I typically push them firmly to the edge, but not all the way off, so the dog feels like it's teeter-tottering. As soon as the dog, and it, that'll cause the dog to want to jump off on its own. I always want the dog to do the work. As soon as he does that, I would reach over and pet him and say the word off. So we're creating a command word for getting off the couch and giving him a little bit of a reward for getting off, because when we take him off the couch, we are demoting him a little bit. Uh, because he has less self-esteem, we're gonna like to pet him under his chin. Now, he likes this anyways, his guardians have identified, which is great, but we wanna do this, especially when we're doing passive training or petting with a purpose. So for passive training, every time he comes to us, we're gonna pet him and say, come. Every time he sits down on his own accord, we pet him and say, sit. Every time he lays down, we're gonna pet him and say, crash, or whatever the word is for crash. When he takes the first bite of his food, we're gonna say, dinner for him, supper for precious. Uh, every time he goes out the door, we can say, mate, outside. So after we do this enough, the passive training is very is a slower way of training your dog, but it's the easiest way of doing it. It's just simply narrating whatever he happens to be doing at the time. We also like to see the guardians petting with a purpose. So that means we're, we're not going to let him jump on our lap and pet him anymore. Instead, if he wants, well, he's not going to be allowed on furniture, but if he wants petting and he comes up and jumps on us or scratches it or barks at us, we're going to tell him to sit. As soon as he sits, we're going to pet him under his chin and say just the word sit. Not good sit, not George sit, just kidding. Um, not go potty, just the command word, and not sit, sit, say it consistently. You can baby talk your dog if you want, but you need to always baby talk your dog because dogs do hear uh, uh, pronunciation and articulation. Um, let me see, so the more that we pet him with the person, purpose and the more passive training we do, then when he starts to figure out, I really, the humans really like it when they pet me or when I come to them, when I sit, when I lay down, or whatever these things are. Now he has a roadmap of things that he can do to make the humans happy. Dogs generally do want to make us happy. We usually do a very poor job of communicating what they can do to make us happy. In his mind, I think he thinks that he is a, the security dog. So when somebody comes to the door, he runs over, he jumps up on the guest to let them know, hey, I'm in charge. That's what uh, typically when a dog jumps up and somebody's coming through the door. So we're gonna use that video above and we're gonna practice the door exercise and continually practice that for about a week. I'd like the guardians to practice at least once a day with each guardian. And if we can get a neighbor or somebody to come by, that would be even better. But if you can do it, two people doing it once a day, and we're texting or calling each other, so it's not a real guest. So when we get a text, we can wash our hands, turn down the stove, end our phone call, whatever it is. And then when the person comes to the door a minute later, we're prepared for it. Our timing is much better and we're not caught off guard. Um, if we can get a neighbor to do it, that's even better because the neighbor comes by, knocks, comes inside, but doesn't actually come past the entryway. Remember, once the dog comes, when the person comes inside, they cannot cross, uh, they can't, uh, the dog can't interact with them until the person crosses the boundary. 
and when he does interact, only with a good, respectable way. And his body language is already looking a lot better than when we first came in. You can see his chin is up. He's not shying away from me. Before, every time I went to pet him, he would turn his head away. So this tells me he's gaining a little bit of confidence. And every time that the guardians answer the door and demonstrate to him that they have it under the situation in control, he's able to let a little bit of that burden of responsibility go and feel a little bit more content, a little bit more relaxed in their handling situation, their leadership. Um, let me see, what else? I'd like to also have the guardians go to YouTube. YouTube is a great resource because everybody, all these dog trainers want to be uh, Cesar Milan. They want a TV show. So go there, make a goal of going there once a week and alternate. So for the next two months, every Sunday, uh, one of the guardians is going to go to YouTube, find an easy, it doesn't have to be hard, an easy trick, uh, balance a treat on the nose, play dead, roll over, whatever it is, and we're going to teach him, we'd like to teach both of them, she's going to need to do a little bit of athletic training, but there's some stuff probably she can do even with her physical capabilities right now, but the more skills that we have as humans, the better our self-esteem and confidence is. Same thing for dogs. So if we can start teaching him, if we can te come up with four new commands uh, that each guardian does at the end of the two months. That's two, that's eight new commands that he has. So practice, teach him how to do it on Sunday. Then all week long we practice that trick or command. And then the next week we practice another. The next guardian takes over and they practice or introduce a new trick. We practice it all week long. So for the next eight weeks, you know it's not that hard to do a trick. Uh, practice, when you're doing practice, keep the practice sessions less than three minutes. Try to practice them several times throughout the day. Don't just do a whole segment at once. Do a little bit, then let the dog sleep or do something else. Do it again, back and forth. Um, let me see, what else? Uh, we want to use the escalating consequences to disagree with the dogs when they're doing the thing we don't want. Remember, the first thing we do is hiss one time only before the dog does the wrong thing. Second thing we do is we stand up abruptly and turn to face the dog. As soon as the dog's stationary, we take two steps backwards. Left, right only, pause one second, then go back to doing what you're doing. Third consequence is we're going to march directly at the dog until the dog turns sideways to us or greater. As soon as the dog turns sideways, we stop. Then we go to the second consequence. Now we're, we're in place. We're pivoting our hips to keep the dog in front of us. As soon as it's stationary, we take two steps backwards, pause one second, then go back to doing what we're doing. The fourth consequence is the leash timeout. You didn't like the leash timeout very much. Um, we're going to put the dog in a leash, step on the leash. In these guys' case, about a foot and a half to two feet away from where it attaches to their, leash, uh, to their collar. Uh, if they protest, we're just going to hang out and wait and let them run it through their system. When they get done, they will sit down. When they sit, if he sits here, I'm going to take my foot that's on the leash and slide it and the leash towards him to take the tension off the leash. And a minute or so later or several minutes later, he will lay down. When he lays down and he's calm, I can take my foot off the leash. At that point, he's free, but he should only be on the leash, un uh, un uh, dragging the leash around un as long as he's supervised. He could injure himself if he's not supervised. Minute or two go by, he stays good, we take the leash off. Minute or two goes by and he starts barking again. As he runs by, we step on the leash and we reapply the consequence. Um, so those are the escalating consequences. Make sure you always start with your hiss, go in order, and eventually you only have to use just the hiss. But right now it'll be hiss, stand up, march, leash. Then eventually just hiss, stand up, march, and then hiss, stand up, and just hiss. Uh, let's see. Um, Precious needs more exercise, and uh, I'd like to see her guardians putting some green beans in with her food and substituting some of her food. They're only feeding the dogs once a day. Precious's case, it might, if possible, it'd be better to feed her three times a day. The more we feed, eat, the faster our metabolism stays going. That's a great, easy way to burn some extra weight is feeding multiple times a day and smaller meals. And so uh, for Precious, I recommend that Anna Guardian kind of does a version of this, putting her food instead of just in the bowl, kind of making a trail, a little ball here, a little ball here, a couple inches apart. And each time we make, maybe make a surf versus two inches for the next ball of food, then three inches between the next between each ball. Eventually it's like a foot, two feet. Now she's got to walk around to get her food. The more she moves around, the more appetite she's going to have, and the more calories she's going to burn, the more fat she's going to burn up, take off. Um, another thing to do, uh, uh, well, she's not a leash dog, um, so we didn't get a chance to go through that. And she's a rescue dog. She's had a lot of litters. I think that that's part of the issue here is I think the guardians felt sorry for the dog and were trying to make up for what they perceived as an uncomfortable life to begin with. And uh, we want to do that, like I said, initially, but eventually we could just end up handicapping our dogs. It's not healthy for them. So the more that we pet with a purpose and do passive training, the better he's going to feel about himself. The more, same thing for her, and you know, the better quality of life that she'll have, the more that she can move around and have fun. Some of the rules we went over would be uh, having to sit before they let him in or out of the door. 
not being allowed to sit in this little L in front of the couch when the humans are eating any food, not being able to be within seven feet of the dining room table when they're eating food, and not being able in between the work island and the, uh, the rest of the counters in the kitchen while food is being prepared. But nobody's eating, the dogs can come in and out of here. They just can't come when somebody's eating. Um, he likes to mount and hump Precious, especially when people come to the door. So if we see him doing that, we need to disagree. Remember, anything that the dogs are doing when you pet them is what you're rewarding. Anything that they do in your presence that you don't disagree, you're giving a thumbs up to. So if we see him humping, we need to hiss right away and stand up and walk over and make him stop. Eventually he'll stop doing that, but it's not healthy for her. It's also not healthy for him to think that he has the dominion over her. Um, let me see, what else did we go over? Um, counter conditioning, the doorbell. Um, if you have a problem with us and uh, the counter conditioning, he would not take a treat from us because he's kind of insecure and probably because we didn't come in and just fallen all over him, which we probably should have done. Uh, but that's okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these treats, we're going to hold it on the flat side, and we're going to smash it so it's like a pancake now. And what I'm going to do is hold it in front of his nose. Now you can see he's not interested in this, but if his guardian was doing it, he probably would take it. Um, so what we do is we let him nibble on it, start nibbling on it, once he's nibbling on it, then we're going to give the code word to our partner. Maybe we say a color, and then that person is going to ring the doorbell. So it's important that he's chewing on this before the doorbell rings. And we have him on a leash to prevent him from running around. The more the dog runs around, the more worked up they get. So if we can keep him uh, sedate or sedentary, it's going to prevent him from getting too excited. Now, if you can't get him to sit and take the treat in this room, Go to the next room, close the door behind you, go to the basement. Keep increasing the distance between him and the doorbell until he can stay seated and chewing the treat and have the doorbell ring and continue to chew the treat. Now, if we have to, we have a two-part doorbell here. We can press it and go ding and hold it. And then the next time the guardian says blue, then we start letting me eat the treat. Then we say dog. Oh, you're going to take it. Oh, he was thinking about it. Um, but that's a good sign that he's insecure. So something else we could do is have guard people come over um, and uh, as he's developing more confidence and have them ask him to sit and then give him a treat. Um, ask him to lay, come to them and give him a treat or pet him or whatever the case may be. So he learns that I can get rewards from other people, not just my guardians. And that social exposure should help him with uh, as well. Um, let me see, uh, the marking is related to him thinking that he is in charge and that's related to not having any rules. So remember when you're coming up with these rules, it's not being mean when you enforce them, you're simply helping shrink his world so he doesn't feel responsible for that anymore and that will help him relax. Now so there are some uh, watchwords that we want to go over. Remember if we come out in the room and we see that somebody's petting, uh, uh, petting one of the dogs and the dog is standing, we say paycheck. That means I think that you might be petting the dog without a purpose. That person who's petting the dog would stop, tell him to sit, and he sits. We pet him under his chin, say just the word sit, not good sit. And then we could say to our partner, actually I asked him to sit before he came in the room. When you flushed the toilet, he got up and I continued to pet him and David said it's okay, which it is. Um, he just has to change his state or prepay for attention. Um, the more, once he gets to the part where he just starts sitting in front of the humans to ask for attention, he's gonna be a lot more confident. And that means he's not gonna be doing the rollover and giving his belly and barking incessantly and all the rest of that stuff. So for the counter conditioning, make sure that, again, we're, we're doing it far enough away where he'll take the treat and stay in a sit. Once he can do that five times in a row, then we take one step closer and repeat that process. When you get to the point where you put the treat in, he's looking around it, or he won't sit, you're close to his breaking point. You cannot practice past the breaking point. This needs to be what we call sub-threshold. So as soon as we get to his breaking point, we stop, and then we you know, maybe play ball or do something else and then come back and do it a little bit later on. Just take note of how far away from the doorbell you were and you start, if we were 25 feet, we start at 25 feet again. Maybe we go to get to 20 feet by the time we end. Then next time we practice, we practice at 20 feet as well. And so each time we're gonna do this, we're gonna keep on going back to the distance we stopped at the day before and do it very progressively. If you do this and you take your time, you'll eventually get to the point where he'll be right next to the box and he could care less the doorbell is ringing. All right, George. He's like, it's Parker. Um, this is uh, Parker and uh, Precious's roadmap to discuss. Oh, before we do that, if you have any questions, make sure you text me. I called the guardian right before I came here, so she should have my personal cell phone number in her, in her cell. Program my name in it, but also put doggone problems, because you probably aren't gonna need, have questions until six months or a year from now, and you're gonna forget my name. Women do that all the time. So this way you can just search for doggone problems. My number will come up, and I want you to call me or text me. I can only help you if, I, if you reach out. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great because that's usually the way it is. There's absolutely nothing wrong with asking for help and I'm here to support you. I don't care if it's a minute after I leave or three years after I leave, 
call or text me, but I can only help you if you let me know. All right, Parker, I uh, got your name down finally. It's at the end of the session. You'd think I eventually would get it sooner, but here we are. All right, this is Parker and Precious's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.